Hello and welcome to Danley Boat Building where we are currently restoring a boat built by the Austin Healy Car Company called the Healy 75. In the previous videos we've been stripping out some fiberglass work that was done to this boat when it was repaired as an insurance job and we've been starting to make some of the timber components that will go back inside the boat to repair its structure. We've also been straightening out the hull that was damaged when the boat was dropped. So if you're new to the channel drop back and take a look at the previous videos in the series and you can see all the work that we've done today. In this video we're going to be making the new frames that will go back inside the boat and we'll also be working on the two main stringers that run down the centre of the boat, tying all those frames together, forming a support for the sole boards and also forming the main engine bearers. We're also going to be taking a look at another Healy boat which we've got at the shop here and that is going to be coming in for some work after this one. That is a Healy 55 which was the wooden predecessor to the Healy 75 and we've got that here to be able to take some patterns and measurements from it for the bits that are missing from this boat so that's been really handy. We'll take a look around that and we'll see how the two boats compare. So we're going to be doing a number of different things. We're going to be doing some scarf joints on the stringers and also some laminations of those timbers. We're going to be patterning and making some frames for the boat. Along the way I'm going to include a couple of little tips for various different processes that we've used in making these parts including getting nice long scarf timbers straight and properly aligned. I'm also going to show you a little bit of work on how I use a Japanese handsaw for cutting nice accurate joints and we're going to be doing a good bit of epoxy work again as we laminate those stringers together, we glue up the scarf joints and we also glue up the frames and coat them with epoxy ready for installation into the boat. So without further ado let's get into the video. So we're starting out by making these two steering blocks that fit up on the forward end of the stringers. We looked at these last week when we had a bit of grief trying to get some of the steering mechanism back out of these blocks. And these are two big 50mm pieces of sapili that will carry all of the steering mechanism within this boat and also the throttle. So all of these parts of the boat are done with direct mechanical linkages that run um, bars through the boat and onto the engine or onto the rudder system. So they're pretty critical for uh, positioning wise and we had to kind of start with these really to make sure that everything else followed off neatly. So standard practice for patterning parts like this is that we just draw around the existing part roughly onto rough sawn timber. And if we're making a pair of, of identical parts then we'll always put them together like you can see here. So a couple of blobs of glue with a glue gun and we stick the two together and we'll cut two at the same time so we get a nice matching identical pair. So um, we'll always cut outside the lines, that's one thing that uh, I do sort of go on a little bit about and it's um, a good practice really to always cut outside the line and then just sort of finish your part back down to the line once you've done all your checks just leaving a little bit of material there in case you need to um, tweak anything. So we cut just outside the line with a bandsaw and then finish that up with a little um, shoulder plane which is very quickly becoming one of my favourite tools. And once those blocks are cut to size, you can see just a little knock with a chisel will separate the two apart. And um, those two little bits of glue from the gun can just be cleaned off. Then uh, these blocks have got some angled bevels on the uh, forward ends of them. This is where the hull forward just starts to come in. And right at the forward end of those stringers, it's just would foul slightly if they were um, left square. So we're just copying those from the dimensions on the existing stringer blocks. Marking those out with pencil, making sure that I know where the scrap side is. And then we cut those with a handsaw. It's probably really the only good way to do this. Try and make a cut like that on the bandsaw where it's beveled in two directions. It's quite difficult, so there's no substitute really for doing that by hand. And again, you can see I'm just slightly outside the line, a little bit too much outside the line in one place there where the saw wandered a little bit. But that's fine because I just go over to a smoothing plane and we'll take off the last bit of material just until that line disappears. And then you can see we've got a nice neatly beveled steering block. 
So there are a few different bevels on those blocks, as you can see, some of them had uh, two bevels on and some just one, but we just copied all of those dimensions from the existing blocks. Then we are on to starting to make the frames. So the procedure for that was to start with frame two, and that is the first frame that carries the forward end of the stringers. So what we wanted to do was to start with frame two to set the height and the width of those stringers, and then also notch them into the laminated transom bow that we made in the previous video. That was gonna give us two points of reference to square those stringers up, get them the right width, and then what we would do is fill all the frames in that sat between those two components and um, reference their inner positions off the stringers. So again, we start with just drawing around the existing frames um, onto rough sawn stock. So we had um, one old existing frame that came out of a different boat, which we were very kindly lent by somebody. And um, we also had the pattern that we've made for our boat. So getting the shape of this was a combination between using the old original existing frame and then also um, taking some dimensions off the pattern that we'd made as well. It's actually surprisingly difficult getting these frames to an accurate size, even when you've got a pattern already made, because there are a lot of dimensions that need to be considered here and making an adjustment to just one of those can have quite a knock on effect to the rest of them. So you can see that what we've got here is um, a pair of pattern frames where we've done them together, but we've still got some material left on the outer edges of the frames. And you'll see the reason for that in just a minute. So we knock those apart and then we put them back onto our pattern so that we can reference some critical dimensions. The first critical dimensions on this frame to get right are the heights at the keel and the chine so that we make sure that the V of the frame is in the right shape so that it's gonna follow the boat. So what you can see here is that I'm lining up the bottom of the frame down at the keel line and then I'm squaring it up at the chines and you'll notice that there is a slight gap in in that joint at the center. So the first job to do is to adjust this joint until you've got the frame touching at the chine and the keel so that we know the bottom edge of that frame is perfectly shaped to the boat and also that that joint in the middle is then perfectly mated. We don't want that to be sat open even by a couple of degrees. That wants to be a nice tight fit down in that section of the frame. So this is the reason for leaving some material on the outer edges of the frame, because as we make the adjustment to this joint in the center, the whole frame then starts to come inwards as we take material off. That's got the knock on effect of then changing the width at the chine and also bringing our stringer spacings in as well. So that's the reason we want to leave a little bit of material there so that we've got enough to play with as we make those tiny adjustments and bring everything into line. So we start by focusing on getting the bottom edge of that frame right with the keel and the two chine points. So once we're happy that we've got that frame pretty much close to size, we'll then thickness that down and um, end up with some stock that is the right thickness. So once we've got that joint in the center right, we can then make a gusset for that frame and we can fix that joint together, um, tie that dimension in before moving on to fine tuning the stringer dimensions and the outer dimensions where that frame meets the chines. So we're just using um, Robin's Super Elite Marine Plywood for the gussets, which is a really nice um, solid Sapili plywood all the way through. A BS1088 approved marine plywood, so really nice quality um, piece of ply there for these gussets. So we're just dry fitting everything. We just used standard wood screws for this because they're all gonna come back out once the epoxy's dried. So we'll screw that together and then we've got that dimension tied in and we can do the final adjustment on the chines and the stringers and then just across the um, floor line there, which is where the sole boards will sit. So we make sure that we've also got a nice straight line there. So we've got a flat floor. Once we're happy that that frame is all dimensionally correct on its um, outer edges, we had to cut the notches in for the floor stringers to clear those little half round dowels that we put back into the bottom of the boat. So that just goes in and out of the boat a few times whilst we take um, dimensions, a uh, combination of taking those from the boat and from the pattern that we made previously. And then the bulk of the material gets chiseled out just to um, remove most of it. And then I used a rounded surform file just to shape those because they're sort of beveled inwards where those timbers 
point back in towards the keel um, and they're also rounded as well so they're a bit of an awkward shape through this frame the rest of the frames are a little bit more straight because um, the boat just flattens out aft but this is a bit of a tricky one so we just use a saw to do some sort of rough cut guide marks initially then a chisel to take the bulk of the material out and then a rounded surf form for the final bit of shaping so there's a good bit of back and forth with the boat during this um, this process to get it fitting right then once I'm happy that all of that is going to fit okay, we just put a small bevel on the frame. Um, this is just done by eye really because it's not uh, hugely critical at this stage. When it's bonded into the boat, there's going to be a little bit of contingency there. So let's take a look at Healy 55 then. This is the predecessor to the Healy 75 that we're currently restoring. And this was an all wooden boat. So it had wooden framework, plywood sides, bottom and deck. Other than that, the boats are pretty much dimensionally identical because a wooden boat was used to make the moulds for the fibreglass ones when they then took over. The beauty of that from our point of view is that the internal framework is almost identical as well. So we could use this for dimensions for positioning our stringers and picking up any information that was missing from our boat because some of the structure was removed before we got it. So you'll see that those uh, steering blocks up forward there are very familiar, as are all of the frames. The only addition really with the Healy 55 and the wooden version was that it had this keel timber down the centre and a couple more longitudinal stringers in order to support the plywood bottom. They also had these intermediate frames that sit in between the main frames, which the fibreglass version of the boat doesn't have. So that meant that we could get our heights and widths for the stringers from this boat because they were exactly the same as they were in the fiberglass one, which was a huge help in making sure that we put everything back in place so the engine's going to fit in the boat that we've got. Now you can see this 55 has also had a tough life. Uh, the bottom of this boat came in whilst the boat was underway and it was actually sunk. And you can see that there's a fair amount of sand in the boat and that was because this was run up to a sandbar in order to save it. So one of the jobs we're going to be doing on this boat is to put a new bottom on it as well as giving it a general spruce up because you can see it's looking quite tired now. But um, certainly for now, this made a fantastic boat to pull some dimensions from for our 75, which was really helpful indeed. So with the dimensions that we pulled from the Healy 55, we've now got the correct positioning for the stringers up at the forward end of the boat in frame two and also at the aft end of the boat where they mate onto the laminated transom boat. Now that we have that information, we can start to make up a set of stringers and get them correctly positioned and sized in the boat. So when we need to machine an accurate and straight piece of timber like this, we will always follow the same procedure. The way that we do that is by starting with a good reference edge. So this would be what we call the edge of the timber, and we run that down the jointer to make sure that that is perfectly straight. Once we've got that straight, we can then focus on getting a face of the timber done, which will be at 90 degrees to the edge. So we have a nice straight face and edge to the timber. These two then become our reference from which all the other measurements and dimensions will be taken as we square the timber up progressively. So we start by using the jointer to put an edge on the timber. This machine has a really long flat bed, which allows us to get a nice straight edge to that timber. And that is our first starting point when it comes to machining. Once we've got a good straight edge on the timber, we can then use the table saw to rip a nice width piece of stock. So the edge that we've just machined then goes up against our fence on the table saw. And by setting that fence accurately, we get a nicely widthed timber. Once the timber's width is dimensioned, we can then start to cut our scarf joints because these are long timbers, longer than the stock we have. So we use the same method for that that we showed you last time where we joined the stringers up, and that is by using our sanding machine canted back to create a angled scarf joint. Then we're on to gluing up the scarf joints. So what we do when we glue scarf joints is that we wet out the mating faces of this joint with unthickened epoxy first. The reason for that is that we have a high level of end grain within this joint and that is going to be a very absorbent wood when it comes to the epoxy. What we don't want to happen is that we apply epoxy to that joint and then the end grain of the timber has the effect of drawing that epoxy away from the joint as it absorbs it. This will cause us to end up with a dry and very weak joint which we don't want. 
So we apply unthinkened epoxy to the mating faces of these scarf joints initially, and we leave that to set up for a good few hours, allow it to absorb into the wood before we then apply a thickened epoxy to the joint and place the joint together. Then it comes to gluing the scarf joint together and I need to credit Will for coming up with this clever little method for making sure this is done nice and straightly. So when you're gluing a scarf joint like this you can quite often lose reference of um, alignment and it's very easy for those two timbers to be slightly skewed from each other. What Will does here is that he puts a little pin in the centre of the end of each timber and he runs a string line down the full length of the timber. This allows him to just slightly twist the scarf joint as he puts it together and when that string is in the center of the joint and centered by the two pins at either end you know that you've got a nice straight piece of timber. So that's a nice little tip that I've learned from working with Will and now passed on to you guys. So sharing information is how we all learn and develop. Once those scarf joints were glued up we could then focus on machining the faces of these timbers so they get taken down through the sanding machine and that takes the scarves back nice and flat and uh, brings us dimensionally to where we should be or just slightly over because we'll do the final facing operation once the stringers are glued up. So we're laminating the stringers here because it gives us a far more stable piece of timber than if we were to use a thick solid single piece of timber. We generally try to avoid using anything over 25 mil in thickness for any timber like this that needs to be dimensionally particularly stable. So we use the same lamination procedure that we used on the transom bow here with epoxy thickened with colloidal silica applied with a notch spreader to each face and then we clamp the two stringers together on um, a nice piece of polythene just to keep everything clean. So we've clamped both the stringers together at the same time so that we can make sure they're both really nice and straight and parallel. Following day, once the epoxy has cured on those, we can then take all the clamps off and begin to machine the edges and faces of these timbers. So we've got a couple of mil over thickness at the moment. We just continue to take those down with the sanding machine, which is a really nice, delicate and accurate way of machining that back. It also copes very well with any epoxy that's on the face. Then we remachine our edge, which is going to be our reference for dimensioning the bottom edge of the stringers. So that's done again on the jointer the same way that we did it when it was a single piece of timber. So we've now got a good straight referenced edge and two faces that are both at 90 degrees to that edge. So all we've got left to machine is the bottom edge of the stringers. And this is a strange sort of tapered shape. So it tapers from probably around about frame three in the boat, uh, tapers down forward and it tapers back aft right to the transom bow as well. We just about managed to pull those dimensions from the original stringers that came out of our boat. And as you can see here, it was a bit of a puzzle in trying to piece those back together. They were broken in several places and we had to cut them in a couple of places as well just to get all of the framework out. So from the dimensions that we were able to pull from those stringers, we could then copy those to the new ones, mark them out with a straight edge, and then just machine that final bottom edge of the stringers. So because that is a very long, shallow taper, we decided to machine that on the bandsaw. And you'll have to forgive uh, the waviness of our cut here, but um, Will's trying to steer a very long timber through the bandsaw, which can be quite difficult to keep straight and I'm trying to steer it from my end whilst getting some uh, quality YouTube video footage for you guys. So I'm trying to do that one-handed whilst operating the camera. So I'm afraid we're a little bit wonky there, but we're outside the line and that is the most important thing. Always cut outside the line and then machine back down to it, which we will do in just a minute. So as you can see, I'm trying to do a, um, a bit of a double job here. So I'm trying to steer the timber and uh, outfeed it from the bandsaw, but also uh, keep the camera going. So there's a bit of a, a running around trying to do things. So <laughs> that's what it's like trying to get this footage sometimes. But there we go. At least you guys can see what we're doing. So we've got that uh, those stringers machined just outside the line, and then it is just a case of taking them back down to that line, which Will is doing with a nice jack plane.
So once the stringers were all machined to size, one of the jobs we had to do was to cut a notch into the aft end of those stringers that was then going to sit onto the laminated transom bow. And I thought that was a really good opportunity to show you the use of one of my favorite types of saw, which is this. This is a Japanese Ryoba saw. So there are a number of really great benefits to using a Japanese saw. One of the primary features of them is that they, their teeth are set so that they cut on the pull stroke which is quite different to uh, Western saws that normally cut on the push stroke. That allows the kerf or the thickness of the blade to be really thin because this blade cuts under tension. So that means that they can do a really fine cut. You're removing far less material from the joint and they therefore cut very efficiently. A Ryoba saw will quite commonly have two different sets of teeth on it. The finest set of teeth is generally used for cross cutting in wood or cutting across the grain. And the more coarse set of teeth is used for rip cuts or long grain cuts, which are down the length of a piece of wood. If you've ever tried to cut with a standard hand jack saw down the length of a piece of timber, you will notice that it is significantly more difficult to cut down long grain with teeth that are really designed for cross cutting. With this saw, you've got both types um, all within one tool. So we start off by marking out our joint. And that is first of all, the height of the notch that I need to cut out here. And then we're going to mark a line all the way around the timber. This is a term known as squaring round the timber, where we use a square to mark equal lines all the way around every side of the timber. And you need to make sure that you reference the face edge that we have machined on this timber with the square in order to make this nice and true because one edge of this timber is tapered. So what you wanna do here as you mark around the corner is to put your pencil on the line from the previous face and then push the square up into the pencil before then marking it off. That will ensure that you transfer the line nice and accurately around the corner of that timber. Once we have all of our marking lines put into position, we can start to cut. So here you can see that I'm using the cross cut teeth of the Ryoba saw and I start with a very light pass on the corner of that timber just to get the blade started. I'll then do a very shallow cut which transfers that down one of the pencil lines and then I'll do a very shallow cut which transfers down the pencil line perpendicular to that one. So what I've got now is a nice guide that is going to keep my saw straight down both of those faces as I cut at the same time. Once those guidance lines are in place, I can continue to cut at a much quicker rate through the full section of the timber. And I know that those first cuts are gonna keep me nice and straight and even. So once my cross cut is done, you can see that I changed to the rip cut teeth on the saw as I'm now cutting down the long ring. And I follow the same process. So I'll start with the saw at an angle on the corner I'll do a shallow cut that takes me down one length of the pencil line and then I'll do a shallow cut that takes me down the other length of the pencil line perpendicular to that. Once I've got both of those guide cuts in place I can then start to remove the material much more quickly. And these Japanese saws really will remove material very quickly. They cut entirely under their own weight and you've got to really resist the temptation to push down on the blade but just let the saw cut nice and quickly and with really light pressure. And you can see that what we end up with there is a really nice neat square joint just outside of that pencil line as I keep preaching on about so that it just gives me a little bit of material to do a final adjustment down to the line. So hopefully that was a nice little bit of interesting insight into the use of a Japanese handsaw. I use them quite a lot in the workshop here and they're a really great tool. So if you haven't got one and you need to do a lot of accurate handsaw work, Go and see if you can find one and um, get it added into your toolkit. It's a really good piece to have. Okay, so we've got our stringers made and fully dimensioned. We've got frame two, also accurately dimensioned and dry fitted in the boat. So those are our reference points now to get the stringers in place. So we put the stringers in, uh, we fixed them down temporarily to frame two and to the transom bow, and we could then start patterning the middle frames up into these stringers where they're gonna meet them. So that consisted of using the glue gun again and some little strips of wood to pick up the key dimensions that we needed from the stringers, which were the top edge, which is gonna form the, um, the base for the sole boards and all the floors that will go into the boat 
and also the outside edge, which is what the, the frames mate up to, and that positions the stringers into them. So we were just using little pieces of timber glued into place here to pick up those dimensions and build the final parts of our frame patterns. So you can see the full set of rather crude, but nice and useful frame patterns now because we had none of this information in the boat originally. So um, we've had to kind of come up with all those dimensions from, uh, from what we can. So then we're on to patterning the rest of the frames. And that is basically very similar to the process that we followed before. As you can see, we're just using those patterns to transfer the key dimensions onto the stock, leaving our little bit of extra material on the outside so that we can do that adjustment to the center joint then we thickness everything down and we dial in slowly those, uh, those key dimensions. So once we've got a full set of frames made up and dry fit into the boat, we'll use this little technique just to offset the stringers and dial in the final tiny adjustments to those critical dimensions. And the way that we do that is that we've propped up the stringers forward and aft by a known offset. And we did that just using a piece of 18 mil MDF that you can see here. So we've raised the stringers up from their native position by 18 mil, and we've used some nine mil plywood to bring the stringers inward from their native position. We offset these stringers by this known dimension in those two different planes. And then we use a marker of the same thickness to then transfer that line from the stringer back to the frame. So where we've got the frames slightly oversized in these dimensions at the moment, we offset the stringers and we bring them up and inwards. And then we use the same offsets to mark those lines back off the face of the stringers and back down. Although we've already got those dimensions in the patterns, there can still be a little bit of variation in either transferring those lines from the patterns to the new frames, or when we cut things and make tiny little adjustments, everything is still just moving around and finding its feet there. So this final process of just offsetting the stringer dimensions in those two planes was just a way to get us a really accurate set of frames that we're gonna fit those stringers nicely down the boat and make sure they're good and straight and well tied into every frame. So, as I said before, there's quite a lot of things to consider here with making these frames, even when we've got a full set of patterns, there are still these tiny little adjustments that we have to make sure that we do to make sure that everything fits perfectly. So once we have done a full dry fit of all the frames and we're happy that everything's gonna fit perfectly, it's on to taking stuff out and getting it ready to actually install in the boat. So that involves gluing up these frames now. And this follows much of the same standard practice that you will see us doing quite a lot. So any end grain joints um, that are potentially gonna be absorbent for epoxy, we wet them out first with unthickened epoxy, which you can see we are doing here. We let that to sit for a little while and we allow it to soak into that end grain so that it's absorbed all that it wants to. You can see the unthickened epoxy here after around about an hour as that's soaked into the end grain. So if we'd have gone straight into glue in the joint, you can see how much of that would have absorbed into the wood and therefore come away from the joint, which is not what we want. So any end grain gets wetted out with unthickened epoxy first. Any face grain, which is far less absorbent than end grain, gets wetted out on each face with thickened epoxy using colloidal silica, the same process that we use for lamination. And you can see me here applying one of the gussets to the frames. So we've got thickened epoxy on the face of the frame, on the face of the gusset, and on the inside of the joint after we've allowed that unthickened epoxy to set up on the end grain. Hope that makes sense. And again, I'm just using standard wood screws on this because once the epoxy is cured the next day, all of these screws are backed out and then the holes are just filled in with thickened epoxy. So in the finished boat, we won't have any screws in this frame at all. It's all gonna be held with epoxy. So following on from that, we're starting to get the frames ready to install in the boat. The first job is to use the Uno sand, which is this little brush sanding machine that I've got. 
um, and it's really handy for just denibbing the edge of a piece of timber. It's sandpaper which is backed up by a brush head and that allows it to curve over surfaces and edges and corners and just slightly round them off so that they're not sharp. We want a nice rounded edge there so that the epoxy coating is going to go round it and we're not likely to burn through any edges. We don't really want sharp corners there. So we give everything a good sand off with a brush sander and key it up and then I screw these little feet in place to hold the frames nice and square whilst we coat them with epoxy. So again we're using West System Epoxy Resin here as I do with pretty much everything and you can see I've got a nice little uh, mixing station going on here. So this is a really simple device that we've just recently put into the workshop which is a silicone kitchen spatula which is fixed into a drill head that's mounted on the wall. That allows us to stir and mix the epoxy quite quickly and very thoroughly and it saves us um, constantly using mixing sticks which is quite tiresome on the arm if you've got a lot to do. So we're just using completely unthickened West System epoxy resin here and we're thoroughly coating all edges and faces of the frames before any parts go in. We do three coats here to make sure that this is an incredibly thorough job and it's all what we call hot coated which means that one coat is applied after the next without allowing the first coat to completely dry. As the epoxy starts to cure it releases this amine blush which we've talked about before and what we don't want to happen is for that blush to then prevent the second layer from bonding. So by hot coating we put one coat on after the next and it's only the final layer that emits the amine blush. What we will do before we install the frames into the boat is that we will wash this blush off the surface, we'll key the frames up and they'll then be ready for bonding into the boat and they'll be completely sealed on all exposed edges and faces with epoxy giving them maximum protection from any future water ingress. So that is pretty much where we're up to at the moment with the Healy 75 restoration. In the next video, we're gonna be starting to prepare these frames to install them finally in the boat, along with the stringers, which have also been epoxy coated. Once that's done, we will have the boat then fully reinforced back to its bottom being full strength with the glass that we've put in and all the new framework. We're also going to be installing some of the other wood components that we made in the previous videos and that will be pretty much getting us completely finished with the structure. At that stage we're then going to look to turn the boat over and we'll be doing some of the preparation work for getting the outside of the hull ready for paint. So that is all coming up in the next videos. Make sure you stay tuned to the channel and if you're not already subscribed please remember to subscribe and you can keep up with the rest of the videos that are coming out for this series. So I hope you found some interesting or useful information in that video and that's all for me from now so I hope to catch you in the next one. Cheers guys!